Well, I think that almost in every case study that there is, that there is a motive for finding a result. And everybody comes in with a specific result in mind. I've usually been talking, Dave, I've been bringing up the Osteen report and looking up secondhand smoke stats through SourceWatch and other things. You have to realize, too, though, that tobacco use became so popular because of the advertising of the health benefits of tobacco smoking back in the 19 early early 1900s and it continued on through to the 1950s before there were any any great uh, changes people didn't have a choice for single hand smoking let alone second hand smoking because it was the popular choice of the time and so if you ask somebody like my mother about her opinion on regular smoking and secondhand smoking and the addictiveness of the of the product and what she would think at the age of 71 who has tried to quit probably two or three dozen times and failed and if she would want to have subjected her children to that in the womb which can cause problems and etc cetera, etc cetera, the secondhand smoking very potentially was the cause of the demise of her first child who didn't survive and her third child who was a twin one survived one didn't and that would be considered secondhand smoking because the fetus doesn't I think that's a really horrible thing to try and put on somebody especially since there's no evidence for it you know to to tell someone that your kid died because you smoked this i think is one of the most vile things that the anti smokers do they claim that sudden infant death syndrome or as it's called in britain uh, cop death yeah, is is the cause of is caused by secondhand smoke, and it's disgusting that anybody would put something like that on a parent. Um, well, no, I'm not saying that they put that on a parent. I don't know if they've done studies on how much secondhand smoke a fetus receives, but it's within the body and their shared systems, and so there's going to be a greater risk than say walking into your local pub and having the choice to leave. So I think that it goes a little bit beyond whether or not a, a, a judge can can prove that their epidemiology was close or so far away from the truth. I think that there was a total shift in thinking when more of the facts came in about how regular smoking affected most people in North America and Europe and whoever did smoke. And I think that evidence is what led to the secondhand smoking um, change because you're right, there had to, there was a shift in thinking and a shift in the propaganda from being pro-tobacco to being anti-tobacco. But that doesn't stop millions upon millions of people from smoking anywhere around the world. And different parts of the world have different feelings about smoking. France, you can go anywhere in France and watch the chef as he dangles a ash above your cooking and talk to them about the effects of smoke and secondhand smoke. And I'm sure that they'll have a different opinion culturally. They've banned smoking in a lot of cafes and things in, in France. Uh, this this banning of smoke because of secondhand smoking has spread all over the world. And it's actually it being recalled by in, some, in some areas, too. Where is it being recalled? Uh, I think the last one I read about was in Germany and uh, I forget the other country. There was, uh, so I think it might have been Ireland where they decided to be lenient because there are so many bars whose only employees are the owner? I think that you also have to take into consideration that I think it's also appropriate places for bans, right? Like Corey was pointing out that in Manitoba, the very first ban of smoking was in an arena where a hockey player was in a hockey arena where a young boy had an anaphylactic reaction to the amount of cigarette smoke in the arena because there was so much of it he had a severe asthma attack and died. What kind of parent takes an asthmatic kid into a smoky environment? But what kind of parent um, when there's no choice? There's no choice to be in a non-smoking arena at that point because every arena is smoking. Therefore, your choice is to play hockey in that arena, which is smoky, and um, have that risk or not play hockey. A good point is raised, and that is the, uh, the responsibility of parents. Around the time that I discovered the Forces website, I, I began to email a lot of places that I believe to be a farce. There was a, the Truth 
whatever they were calling themselves, where they were... Yeah, they're, they're, they're vile. Yeah, I mean, they parade themselves on TV in these commercials as if they're some kind of rebel, when there's nothing rebellious about, you know, blowing on the trumpet of the empire that's telling you what you're supposed to do. And that what they're telling you you're supposed to do is not smoke. And so this company gets a lot of young, young people, teenagers, people that look urban, to go in and, and harass the smoking company. And I'm not sticking up for the big tobacco, of course. I'm simply trying to say what they're representing themselves as. It's, it's kind of like that uh, that hillbilly comedian who tries to pretend that he's just a regular redneck, but he's a multimillionaire. And, you know, there's a lot of posing that, that goes on. And so I, I emailed them a couple different times, and I'm going to share one thing with you because my point is made about parenting. The uh, initial email that I sent to them, why the half-truths? In an ideal society, I feel people would be given the actual facts. These facts would be offered from an authority that bases its research not on agendas, but on the desire for the whole truth. Why is the whole truth such a feared thing in this country? The truth about marijuana, let's say, is not that it is a bad thing, as every government-funded organization would have the less educated believe. It is an inanimate object. It doesn't do anything on its own. We always end up with the onus of responsibility. We as individuals. It is not a wholly good thing either, as many potheads would have the rest of the flock believe. Is objectivity a completely lost cause in our world? I speak about marijuana in this letter because it is a specific issue, and I wouldn't expect anyone to read the entire letter on what I have to say about the drug hypocrisy in America. But if, if it is of any interest to the person that reads this, I am very curious to hear what someone involved with the propaganda of the drug consciousness in America has to say about this topic. I can assure you that I have no agenda other than finding the truth, not only in this matter, but in life. And if I were presented with a more evolved way of thinking, which meant that I had to alter my way of thinking currently, I would accept this change graciously. So they write back and they basically said, you don't need to write us about marijuana, we're, we're only talking about tobacco here. So I write back and say, I was using it as an example, I'm sorry if that confused you. I was making a point about parenting. Now, we, we are responsible for our lives. It is our responsibility to, to make our lives go the way we want it to be. And as far as smoking goes, you know, long before an addiction happens or a, a, a lung has to be removed, a decision is made. Why is there, Why is all this attention and energy not going towards poor decision-making uh, or towards poor parenting, which allows people to be the cultural holes? When drugs first became uh, an interest of mine when I was a teenager, my mom immediately, having taken drugs herself as a hippie, sat me down and wanted to make sure that if I was going to be curious about these things, that I explored them in a safe manner. So because of that, I never really rebelled in drugs. I never really went overboard with any of them because I was just trying to experience things. I wasn't trying to show mom what I could do. So I think parenting is a, is a very good point to bring up with smoking. Matt, did you have anything to add your perspective on smoking or secondhand smoke? Well, I always felt that the secondhand smoking um, information was kind of pushed pushed a little bit to um, I mean I thought it was somewhat fair I mean but I, I sensed that it was pushed a little bit to try to curb smoking like like it was a little bit of um, propaganda and not to go off subject here but uh, I just ordered um, electronic cigarette by blue blu mm-hmm I guess one of the more popular ones right right at the moment, but um interested to see how that goes because uh, we had been talking about that seven, eight years ago. I have one of those sitting on my desk right now. Not that brand, but a different brand. I like it. It's uh, it's, it's a way to smoke without without all the side effects of, uh, of tobacco, uh, of, of inhaling tobacco. But... Actually, they, that that brings up a good point. Here we have the electronic cigarette spits out water vapor, which looks like smoke and feels like smoke in your lungs because part of smoking is the ritual of it, and so it can satisfy you as a smoker. But we're seeing legislatures passing laws against that in public places. There's absolutely no possibility that this water vapor, which just dissipates in the air, leaves no smell, leaves no nothing, uh, can cause any harm to anybody. And yet 